Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. So now both uh, Victoria and South Australia are on the path out of lockdown, uh, though the economic and uh, psychological damage to residents of both states will continue to be felt for months to come. During every lockdown in Australia, some of the first businesses to be closed and the last to be permitted to reopen by the state for health reasons uh, were gyms and sports facilities. Uh, this was also the case uh, with uh, Victoria's second uh, lockdown and with South Australia's uh, first step towards its so-called uh, three-day circuit breaker lockdown last week, which has thankfully ended. This is despite the fact that regular exercise, which was also banned completely in South Australia uh, uh, during their, uh, well, for the first day and a half of their lockdown, they weren't even uh, allowed the one hour per day of exercise that our small Bernians uh, were allowed uh, during our stage four lockdown. Uh, exercise is of course good for people's mental well-being. Uh, helps build up your immune system to repeal uh, viruses such as the coronavirus, uh, as, as well as uh, all sorts of, of other uh, ill health nasties, along, of course, with health, healthy eating. Many Australians, including myself, have uh, put on weight during this lockdown. Now that Victoria is largely reopened and uh, we can now travel uh, interstate, uh, there is no excuse for, for not getting active uh, anymore and working off those uh, lockdown kilos. My first guest uh, for tonight is uh, GM owner and operator Chris Preston uh, to discuss uh, 2020's war on healthy exercise uh, during the coronavirus pandemic and the impact uh, lockdowns have had on the fitness industry and what options are now available uh, to all of us if we want to uh, to fight off COVID and other viruses and what personal fitness and lifestyle advice he, he can offer. Chris, welcome to the show. <clears throat> Thanks, mate. Pleasure to be here. Uh, now, uh, you've been able to be uh, officially reopened for, for nearly a month now. Uh, what's it been like back at the gym? So has there, there been a, a, a rush in, in new memberships or is it just the, the regulars returning? Yeah, it's been good. We're probably um, like a lot of our, a lot of gym has a core group. So, you know, your big box gyms might have a thousand members or 2,000 members, but it's probably like 20% of those that actually turn up and are consistent with their routine. That 20% is always going to come back straight away. And we found that they're the ones that were sort of chomping at the bit to come back. Um, if any of them didn't come back, it was purely due to, you know, a loss of income, didn't have their job anymore, didn't have any security or, weren't financially in a position to come back. So we found that because we're a little bit more of a, a premium with our training. We're not just like a, a $10 gym membership where you pay for group personal training and coaching with us. So we're a little bit different. Um, but in saying that, you know, we still felt the same statistic across the board. Um, <clears throat> we did see a lot of people not return. But on the flip side of that, we did see a lot of new faces um, show up. A lot of people that had maybe taken it for granted that, um, you know, that maybe had fallen off the wagon with the gym here and there or maybe didn't go because they just sort of couldn't be fucked or whatever. My, excuse my French, I swear a bit when I get passionate. Um, so I'll try and hold back. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, we've, it's probably been half and half. There's people who have come back and um, there's been a lot of newcomers that have probably woken up to the fact that, hey, um, being isolated and told I can't go to the gym has made me realise how much I actually need it. And of course, this is the, the first day of Melbourne, uh, well, Victoria, semi-unmasked. Uh, you don't have to wear a, a face mask now when you're uh, mm -hmm. outside and can socially uh, distance. Though I was looking at the, because the Victoria's Department of Health and Human Services has minute details about when you must wear your, your mask. And they, they've mentioned still uh, at the gym, even though, of course, most of the time you should be doing strenuous exercise there, uh, which of course, and, and this is the same thing in, in, in hospitality venues, is that when you walk in, 
uh, you have to have the mask on, but when you sit at your table, uh, you, you can take it off, which they, they want you to do the same at gyms where I mean, if you're not doing strenuous exercise or just walking in and that, uh, 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 keep it on, which of course it's, it, 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 it has no medical benefit if you're constantly putting it on and taking it back off. <laughs> it's interesting about the mask and it always has been from day one. And there's one thing that I learned very on as a trainer and it was, if you're in the gym, if you're, if you're training by yourself, or even if you were just training a client, the number one rule that you always had was that you never ever touch your eye whilst you're training. Never wipe your face across your eyeballs because your actual, your eyeballs is the first point of contact and the most susceptible point of contact to contract any form of bacteria, either give you the flu or, or make you crook. And we're not being told to wear goggles. Well, this is what was is, well, mm. the, the justification for, for closing gyms uh, uh, during the, well, the, the initial stages of the restrictions, which then became the, the lockdown back in March this year, is that uh, because gyms have mo oh, multiple users on uh, equipment, uh, most gyms uh, and, uh, back in uh, pre-COVID times were 24-7, were all members have like a dongle which lets them in uh, after hours they're, they're 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 unmanned their justification for them closing was that yeah because all these different people were touching them and people sweat when they exercise they ooze droplets that it was just an unsafe environment <laughs> yeah it's an interesting comment like it's actually it's been proven and they've even come out and said it i think it was the world health put it on their site a little longer that even in the early days that it doesn't transmit through sweat so the whole sweat part has got nothing to do with any of it because it doesn't make any sense and like you don't you don't just sweat out bacteria you sweat out water because your body gets hot so it has to cool itself down that's what it does like a car has a radiator it has an outlet that's just what happens if it didn't if it didn't have an outlet it would um it would get trapped there and you would overheat so it's that's got nothing to do with it. Um, <clears throat> so to me, that was strange from from the word go. And I mean, I think one of the biggest things as well that I worried about was was contact tracing. And yeah, they couldn't even get their own contract contact tracing right with the hotel quarantine debacle. And you know, that was one of the main reasons for this this second lockdown, which we were probably most pissed off about, was because nothing ever came from a gym. And as far as far as my knowledge goes and from what I've heard, I haven't looked 100% deep into it, so don't hold me to it, but I'm still yet to hear about a gym that's had a massive outbreak and had to have... Well, there was speculation uh, that uh, Peter Dutton, mm -hmm. our Home Affairs Minister, who was diagnosed with coronavirus uh, early in March, that he got it from a Sydney gym, but that was... They never conclusively uh, proved that. No, that's right. Nothing's nothing's been said in stone that you know a gym is is a place where it spreads, and if it is, it's it's easy to knock on the head. Like we have the best contact tracing in any industry. We we've had it for years. Even the most basics of basics of gyms would have at least at a bare minimum a sign in sheet at the front desk, time in and a time out. And for a lot of other businesses, they don't even have that. And we've had that for years, let alone like the dongle scanners, like you said, you know, time in, time out, you know, who was there, who was around them, who would have been within an hour. And on top of that, if you go one step further and look at a gym model like ours, where we do proper structured training, I could tell you three years ago, who was in at what time at six o'clock on the 21st of June in fucking 2016. I could tell you the people that were in that session, and I could backtrack to the workouts that we planned for the group, and I could probably tell you what equipment they touched. Uh, the only people who don't seem to remember uh, where they were or what happened on certain days are, are, are politicians, especially where they appear before uh, uh, inquiries or royal commissions. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that. Because uh, <laughs> you recall that uh, when uh, Dan Andrews uh, allowed 
uh, it began to allow small uh, private home visits. He encouraged people to uh, maintain records of who visited your private residence. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not a politician. I, I've, I know who's visited my house on cer cer certain days. Yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, with the, I mentioned the, the dongle system, and most gyms also have uh, CCTV uh, as well. Uh, the reason why uh, there is that well, surveillance is to make sure that people are not well stealing uh, uh, gym time by giving the dongle to uh, a friend, which uh, which is known to to happen. And I know that gyms in their their uh, their terms of membership that's a pretty severe uh, violation. So as you said, there's the, the uh, gyms they they already have a these records subject to privacy provisions about who's been there and when yeah that's right and it's it's important for us if um if something happens in the gym like equipment breaks or a window gets smashed or a mirror gets cracked because someone's knocked the weight at it you know we can easily look back and we can track down to see who it was a we can make sure that they're okay and then b we can make them liable for what happened uh, now, when the gyms were closed during the first and, and second wave, you, uh, one of the, the four reasons to, to leave uh, the home were to exercise, which could be a, a walk or a jog or a, uh, a bike ride. Uh, though, especially during the, the second lockdown, Dan Andrews, he hit out, out of people who, well, he didn't want people to, to exercise all day or travel long distances to say, go for a a hike or something because he said this was all about limiting movement but if you're exercising for what however many hours in the, the open air and you're away from it, people uh and say if you're traveling say three or four hours for a, a hike in the, the yarra ranges for example like obviously you're traveling in an enclosed car so what's the what's what's the risk there was it just that uh, we weren't staying home as much as he uh, as much as he wanted us to <laughs> yeah i think you hit the nail on the head i mean it didn't make sense that you you couldn't go for a you know a one hour drive and go for a hike up a mountain in the middle of the bush by yourself but you could go to bunnings with a thousand other people all touch the same hammer and put it back on the shelf and no one cared and then, of course, when the, the, the stage four lockdown uh, was implemented in, in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne residents were limited to one hour of exercise per day within uh, five kilometres uh, from their, their place of residence. Uh, so kept under house arrest for 23 hours uh, a day. Uh, so that severely uh, limited people's ability to just get uh, get well you couldn't get fresh air at that time because uh, uh, unless you were uh, jogging you had to wear the mask all the time including uh, up until yesterday so options for to, to do some decent exercise well uh, supervised exercise with a personal a personal trainer that was that was banned but to just get any sort of fresh air some uh some miles some miles on what it, i've forgotten the name of those uh watches uh, uh watch things that track uh oh, meters <laughs> Fitbits, yes <clears throat> yes that, that was severely limited for for six weeks yeah and like you know the, the biggest thing about all that and, and one thing that we all recognize as industry leaders and coaches was that people if you had a gym like I know a lot of people right, that have home gym set up at home and they might use it for a month and then it's like a cat with the cotton ball. Like it grabs it, makes a mess of it, it plays with it and then once it unravels, it's like, oh, well, that's that. And what we're finding was people were trying to train at home. They were trying to work from home. They were trying to eat and cook all their meals at home. Some people were trying to school their kids from home. And then they were on top of that, they were still trying to fit in their workout or their daily steps. So all of a sudden you're confined to, you know, these four walls to try and live your whole life. Yeah, take what you want from it. But at the end of the day, people want communities and that's what gyms are. 
gyms are communities that are around people. There's energy, there's connection, there's relationships. For a lot of us, it's the routine. It's, it's having somewhere to go. The pump up music on the way. Uh, when you get there, it's your routine, whether you have a protein shake or whatever it might be. You smash your workout, you say good out to a few people, you cool down, then you drive home, good tunes, and you go and eat healthier food because you've, you know, you've exercised. So you naturally want to do good for your body. People that um, you know fell off that wagon and fell out of routine probably found that they ate more shit during lockdown than ever. One, of course, you were restricted, convenience, Uber Eats, knock on your door straight away, but there's less drive for people to eat healthy when you're not putting in the work. Uh, there are some people who will have the, the space and uh, financial resources and are disciplined enough to be able to continue their exercise routine uh, at home. I, I recall uh, during the, the, the lead up to the lockdown, uh, uh, fitness uh, equipment, uh, there was a surge in sales from that. Uh, but uh, as I just alluded to before, not everyone has a spare a uh, few thousand dollars lying around uh, to, to purchase, what is it, a, a, a cross trainer, exercise bike or, or treadmill or weights. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, like that's only, that's one, one fifth of why people go to a gym is for equipment. Every gym has got equipment. And yeah, you'll have limited equipment at home. It's up to you what you make and what you want to do with it. But like I said, people want community. They want to be around people and you don't want to, yeah, you talk about disciplined people. You're talking about fucking 1% of our population. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I think you're right. That's, uh, that's sadly the case. Uh, but also there's well, people such as yourself uh, and I know plenty of them gym junkies who need their, 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 their daily exercise. They just, uh, it, it, they just can't be cooped up without any uh, exercise as well. And then of course, there's the, the gym owner and operator such as uh, yourself left without an, uh, an income for, for months at a time. And was it job, job keeper is, is no substitute for a, a regular business. <laughs> yeah. Look, some of the grants that they were dishing out were probably really beneficial for some gyms for, for small studios. But to give you an example, one of my really close mates, he's got 13 gyms. With that, he didn't get 13 grants. He got one grant. He got the same grant as everyone else for 13 gyms. So his 10K that he got wouldn't have even hit the sides. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and as uh, uh, one of the, the people that I know who is a, a small business uh, advocate, uh, the uh, th small business people, they don't want money thrown at them for, for nothing. Yes, like businesses need profits, uh, uh, cash flow to uh, survive, but it's about building something. It's about building, as you said, a, a community. I, yeah. If you compare them to uh, go, go across industries to cafes, uh, pubs, like they, they, people who own and operate those, obviously they want to make a profit, but they, they also love the, the social aspects of running a, a cafe or a pub, seeing their, uh, their, their, their regulars, their very social beings. Yeah, for sure. And because like, that's our sole purpose, you know, not all of us, but many of us have, we've come from nothing, you know, we've never had money. We put in the hard yards. And like you said, you know, People saying, oh, you need to give more money to small business. You need to do this for small business, more funding, more job keeper, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, like, I don't, we don't fucking want your money. The last thing we wanted was government handouts. All we wanted to do was just open the doors again. We just wanted to open the doors, get back in the trenches, get back serving people and helping people feel better about themselves, achieve their goals. And especially from a mental health point of view, talk about the gym junkie that didn't have it. And they've had that taken away from them. Yeah, they might go there, you look in the mirror, okay, he's quite big, gym junkie, blah, 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 however you want to stereotype that. But like for that person mentally, how they how it makes them feel mentally to actually go somewhere to switch off 45 minutes, hit that session and leave is probably what keeps that person sane so they can go home and be happy and not be fucking grumpy because they haven't been able to use their energy and haven't been able to stimulate the 
endorphins and get the good feel um, neurons pumping through your body. Like there's a, there's a big, big flow on effect from this. And I think the, the, one of the things that annoyed me the most was that we didn't, no one gave us a chance. Gyms were never given a chance. We weren't given a chance to be free from this virus. We weren't given a chance. It was just, okay, shut down. I would have said fair enough. If 60, 70% of gyms in Victoria all pushed and spread the virus, but that didn't happen. And also a, another industry that was forced to close during stage four, even though there'd been no transmission was, was hairdressers. Mm, same thing. That, they were allowed to be open during the first lockdown. There was no outbreaks anywhere at, at hairdressers, but you sort of got the feeling, especially from, from the, the stage four restrictions, uh, that, that they, they just closed more things just to, to make it seem like this is a more serious lockdown. Yeah, it was interesting. And, like, I've, I've got a theory about it. <laughs> it's nothing more than a theory. I don't have anything to back it apart from logic and what I know. And, I mean, if you look at council gyms, that are obviously local government, government funded. A lot of governments put a lot of money into these leisure centres to make them look pretty and fit them out with, you know, two, three million dollars worth of equipment, like ridiculous size. Nothing compared to like the scale of what we do. Like we're down here in like a, a cost wise and a council gyms, like, I can't be with the amount of shit they put into it. But they're leeches. They're leeches for the system. They all run at a loss. Every council gym runs at a loss. They all suck money from the government. All their staff are casuals, they're casual workers, so they just got put straight off. They didn't care. But it was the disproportionate response in that respect, like you know, an owner-operator gym is completely different than a council gym because you've got people that have a job and rock up and they're just a personal trainer for the council gym and, yeah, they get this massive hourly rate because they're a casual, so they're probably getting like 30, 35 bucks an hour. They work on a Saturday, all of a sudden we're getting 70 bucks an hour. For us, like, we can't do that shit because it's not viable for our business model. But you know, people that show up for a job, then you've got people that give a fuck. And that's the difference. And, you know, we show up to create a community. We show up to create a space where people can feel good and feel like they're a part of something. Whereas you know, most council gyms run at a massive loss every year. Um, now you're talking like well within the hundreds of thousands of dollars losses per year. And if you want my theory, <laughs> gyms were shut to stop that money flying out the door. I actually haven't heard that uh, before, uh, that, that theory, but it's an interesting one. Um, but, yeah, when it comes to these uh, decisions to just, well, as we know, our political leaders were just making it up as they, mm. they went along. Uh, I don't think they'd be capable of that sort of long-term planning. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's the only thing that made sense to me was I know that you know their wages are very high. They got a big a big bill to foot every week for council gyms' wages. Now, on September the fourteenth, when the easing of the the stage four lockdown began, what a known as uh, outdoor boot camps or uh, outdoor private sessions with a, a personal trainer were uh, allowed. I, what uh, what was the the impact of of that? So was that uh, uh, was that feasible for for many uh, personal uh, trainers and instructors? Were they because it's it's not something that really many of us had heard was was popular. Yeah, I mean, we kind of had our neck in the noose, right? It was like you could go all out with an outdoor setup because all of a sudden now you're weather affected. So you need some form of protection overhead in case it rained. Obviously, you can't have walls because then that makes you an indoor session and you can't run it. So you could go out and you could put all this stuff together and make a whole new business model. But then like with what's happened within say five, six weeks later, all of a sudden you can get back in your gym. So for us, it wasn't viable. For the amount of people you could have per session to the amount of people that would actually show up, wasn't viable, um, which is why we just chose to stay online and coach our members online. And we just stuck with that, not 
putting our neck out too far because, yeah, you can adapt and pivot to all this stuff, but we all had faith in you at the end of the day that it was all just going to just slowly just go away. And that's what we're seeing here in Melbourne. We're starting to see it just sort of fizzle out and go away. How long they keep pushing all this for, I don't know. But um, I think we all know what the end game with that is and what they want to be the uh, solution for things to get back to normal. But, um, I, yeah, look, half of the stuff that they came out with was not realistic. Even when we could open and operate in the gym again with 10 people per class, like we run groups of 20 to 28. So you're now asking us to open, but you can only run it, you know, 30, 40% but my staff will still have to do the same hours. So now I'm still on 30, 40% income potential and I've still got the same overheads. Uh, because when uh, at first uh, regional gyms were allowed to open and then Melbourne gyms, it was the, the one person per eight square meters, which is mm -hmm. that that's more than uh, hospitality. It's now with the further easing today, it's back to one person, four square metre. And as I mentioned, the was it, mask rule has been uh, slightly relaxed. Uh, so things are a, a, a little bit uh, easier today. Are gyms uh, allowed to, in Victoria, allowed to be 24 seven now, or do they always have to have somebody there to be a de facto COVID marshal? I honestly haven't looked at what the latest legislation is that came through over the weekend, but to my knowledge, it still has to be staffed. And yeah, they were, you know, you've got to have your COVID marshal on site during your, your staffed hours. And for once again, it's a part of our business model that's not viable. And, you know, they want all this cleaning done. They want all this sanitizing done, which is fine. We're happy to do it, but they've got to foot the bill. You want us to do all this shit? They're going to have to foot the bill for it. We saw when the the, the Melbourne virus uh, went north to, to New South Wales in uh, uh, June, July, uh, Gladys Berejiklian and the Premier up there, uh, even though she's been the, the least worst, uh, she still mandated that gyms up there have uh, COVID marshals, which meant they couldn't be 24-7. I think the... The rule is now that uh, they don't need a COVID marshal if there's less than 20 people, which uh, begs the question, what if uh, 21 people show up at uh, midnight when it's a 24-7 uh, gym? Do, does, does a COVID marshal have to rush down or something? What's the, the, the go with that? Yeah, I, a lot of gyms, I mean, depending on what system you've got that operates your fob tag to swipe in, you can restrict the amount of entries, so you could restrict that to only 20 swipes. So it would only allow 20 people in. As soon as someone buzzes out, it would recognise that and then allow one more person to come back in. I mean, that's how you could automate it and you could still run with that model if you didn't want to have a COVID marshal between, you know, a select few hours. But for a lot of 24-hour gyms, they're probably not going to have any more than 20 people at once between the hours of, you know, 11 p.m. and probably 4 a.m. There's those hours between uh, that period, which are, are quite dead. You get the occasional shift worker in, but I mean, there's ways around it, that's for sure. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I still don't know where these numbers come from. I don't know why 20 is different than 21. I don't know why 20 is different than 50. If you're playing by the square meter rule and doing everything else, I don't see why all of, all of a sudden they can just call 20. It uh, all comes back to what I said earlier about, you know, the disproportionate response, like gyms are different sizes. 20 people is different in my gym than what 20 people looks like in a, you know, a massive snap fitness. Now, we've still got uh, a one more uh, step in uh, Victoria's roadmap uh, uh, to reopening. Uh, which we're in the, the we began the, the last step today. Uh, the final step is called COVID normal, one of those uh, uh, 2020 uh, globalist terms. Uh, so the original roadmap said 28 days without any 
new cases and no cases, no active cases statewide. Uh, we're currently at 24 days with uh, no new cases and we still have one active case in the state who's been in hospital for quite a bit though uh, Dan Andrews has modified the mo roadmap to just say when public health advice allows he said that he's going to announce the the COVID normal step on uh, December the the 6th uh, so there is one uh, one more opportunity uh, for our benevolent leader to, to make your uh, <laughs> business uh, more sustainable and allow more people into the uh, the gyms, but they, they are open. Uh, but uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, people's uh, ability to uh, get out and exercise has been restricted, which meant they've had this routine with, uh, where they've been stuck at home. And as you're talking about before, routines, are, uh, once you're in them, uh, cha uh, uh, changing out of them uh, is is difficult and exercise, especially strenuous exercise, when you've been lounging around for for quite a while, uh, it's it's quite a shock to the the system. Uh, the old thing, no pain, uh, no no gain. So I'm not sure if people have asked you for uh, advice about how to get out of the the lockdown routine, get your body jolted to be. Uh, active uh, again. I'm asking for myself uh, as well because uh, well, it was the first day of the uh, uh, unmasked outside. So I went for a two to three hour uh, unmasked walk because it's hard to as it just walk, like uh, do a, a fast walk uh, when you've got this mask over you. But I also did some jogging uh, as well, jolt up my my system. So. Uh, you're the uh, the expert here. How's how's the best way to, to get in back into healthy routines? Yeah, look, a lot of it's going to come from, like you said. A lot of people have picked up some bad habits. We've got to be complacent. Yeah, we do we do want these things, but now we're at a point where it's like, all right, fuck, I I've got to go and do it. And if you've been sitting around contemplating, there's different phases of motivation that people go through and. There's like contemplation, pre-contemplation. So you go through those phases where you're contemplating whether you should go or not. Um, at the end of the day, like for me, when it comes back to getting routine, it comes down to having a schedule. And you have to have a schedule. For Firstly, a lot of people now working from home don't need to get up as early in the morning anymore. They can snooze in for another hour or two hours. So you become fucking lazy in the morning. They just hit the snooze alarm, bang, hit snooze again, hit snooze again. Straight away, you're building bad habits instantly. That's your first test of self-discipline. If your alarm goes off and you hit snooze, you failed. You already failed the day. That's your time right there to the alarm goes off. You set your alarm for that time. So be accountable to it. And then you need to have a schedule for your day, especially if you're working from home. This is the biggest thing because everything's sporadic. You've got a bit of freedom. You've got a bit of choice to just sort of get up, go here, go there, duck out for 20 minutes, come back. I'll finish it later and the next minute it's, you know, it's 12 o'clock at night and you're trying to finish something which you could have done in like a two hour block at home, but you didn't because you didn't have any accountability and you didn't have any structure and you didn't have the discipline to follow any of that. So you got to have structure first, which then you need to have the discipline because structure and discipline equals routine. So there's like your, your formula. If you don't have structure first, you don't have anything. So if you have to the hour or to the half hour, like what you're going to do every day, you don't have to do this every day. You might do this for like two or three weeks and build the routine and you can have structure. You can have everything laid out on paper. It can look nice and pretty, it can look easy and nice and achievable. But if you don't have the discipline to follow the structure, that's where you fail. So you have to have your structure and then you have to have the discipline to stick to it. It's like 10 o'clock, I'm meant to be here. Shit, okay, better go do that now. 10.30, I'm supposed to be... Um, doing my warm up right now and going for a 30 minute walk before I start a 45 minute session. The 10 30 hits the clock, bang, I'm there, I'm out the door. Like, have that structure in place, have the discipline to follow the structure that's going to create routine, and then that gives you freedom. You don't have this anxiety, you don't have this panic, like, fuck, what have I got to do? Oh, I forgot to do this, I forgot to do that. 
Like that's what breeds a bad habit and a bad routine is because we're in that fight or flight all the time. And then you get used to it. And then we reach for bad things because we feel like we failed. We start the self-loathing, oh, I'm fucking lazy, I'm fucking fat, whatever your bullshit people are going to say to themselves. Now is the time to turn it around, get yourself the structure, be disciplined, start building yourself back up again, be positive to yourself because you're not the only one that's put on weight, you're not the only one that's feeling unhealthy and unfit right now. You know, you're looking at 95% of the population. I tell you right now, my average weight increase from my clients at the gym has been five to eight kilos. Some people have put on more. So if you're worried that you've put on weight, what are you worried for? Everyone's in the same basket. We're all in the same boat. It's what you do. It doesn't matter what, what's done and what's happened, but all that really matters and what defines you is what you do and how you overcome it. Structure, discipline, routine equals freedom. And if you're, if you're just sort of worried about, oh, I'd say, it's, as I was saying, it's a, it's a hard adjustment to go from uh, just being stuck at home to a uh, strenuous exercise, just even if you just get out and about, because uh, everything is open now, there's no travel limits, uh, pretty much everything is open, I'll bet, with some, some limits. Like, get out and, like, don't, don't just go out because Dan said so now, but pre-COVID, we all took these freedoms for, uh, for granted, uh, the fact that we could be uh, adventurous and we certainly need to to do that again if you are sort of a just stay at home person pre-covid don't be don't be like that again yeah that's it i think if you're somewhat stuck and feeling like you have fallen into a rut because of what's happened right write yourself a list of what you did pre-covid write down what that looks like write yourself a list tomorrow from start to finish of what you do during the day and compare the pair find what you're missing find what you're lacking and then just implement one thing at a time but a lot of us can get overwhelmed when we haven't got everything right and then it seems like it's such a chore to get back to do it it's like oh, i haven't if you're a meal prepper i haven't done my meal prep today um if you get up and go for a walk every morning and you've stopped doing that because now you're sleeping in that's another thing if you, if you don't have a proper sleep schedule. So if you're not setting a time where you actually go to bed every night to get a full like eight hours sleep, and then you know that if you go to bed at that time, sleep and your alarm goes off, that you've hit that target, like that's another thing. So for me, like when I coach a client, I'm looking at what your daily steps are. I wanna know how many steps you're doing a day. 10,000 is a bit of bullshit. You only really need to do 7,200, that's study. We push our clients to do 8,000 minimum. So we go 8,000 steps a day. Um, we look at sleep quality. I want to know how well you sleep and how long that you sleep for. So how many hours you slept and what was your sleep quality like? Rated out of 10, right? So sleep and steps come first. So we get them down pat. Then we look at nutrition. Then we look at what you're eating because if you're sleep deprived, that affects what you eat. If you're tired, you're probably going to eat more shit because you want that sugar hit, so you reach for something quick and fast, nice and easy. So it's like a compound. So we look at sleep, steps, nutrition, and then what your workout is and what, you, what your training is like. And they're like sort of like the four pillars that we look at. So um, they're the things that I would recommend that you look at if you are in a rut. It's looking at what was my routine um, pre-COVID and what am I missing now and implement one thing at a time, set yourself a small goal and you do one, one task a week and build on that. And then within like a four or five week period, um, you know, you might find yourself well and truly back on your feet, but a lot of us get overwhelmed thinking that we have to just go bang and just go all out back into absolutely everything. And that can be overwhelming and can further put you off and create some form like a mild anxiety and overwhelm. Now, as you said, uh, every gym uh, is different. There's different options uh, for people when they uh, they join a gym. Uh, if most uh, uh, or 24-7 gym memberships, they can cost around 20, uh, 15 to 20 uh, uh, per week. Uh, a lot of gyms th uh, that I've uh, been to, they write you a complimentary program uh, when you uh, join, but there's also uh, for an additional uh, fee the group fitness classes and also one-on-one 
personal training because it's it's also good to have uh, somebody bark at you to push you further uh, to, to uh, uh, say so you're you are more capable of uh, uh, pushing yourself uh, building your your strength and then there's also uh, what's increased in popularity is the the MMA uh, uh, training uh, gyms yeah I and mean, the interesting point there and something that I did miss um, talking about getting back on track like book yourself a PT book yourself one PT a week maybe pay for 10 sessions up front or get yourself on some form of contract like commit yourself get committed and then you have accountability because if you don't show up then you let the trainer down so that's going to help you build some accountability it's going to breed discipline you might only do like four six weeks of that once one or two sessions a week before you know it you'll be back in your own routine uh, and you will feel both physically and, and mentally better because uh, i've uh, i've done what i've just described uh, in the past many years ago um uh, both a combination of a gym routine and uh personal uh personal training i lost 25 uh, kilos but uh, yeah. obviously due to circumstances i'm one of those people that's uh, led up by the the wayside but i know that i'm capable of it and yeah i want to want to uh, do it again and yeah no more excuses now for anybody yeah 100 percent. like you, you you never get anywhere if you're just going to keep looking back in the review mirror like if you look in the review mirror for too long you're going to crash and you need to just keep looking forward. You, perfect example is yourself. You've done it. All you have to do is do it again. Mm. And that, that's life. Life is it's full of challenges. And if we weren't challenged every day, it would be quite boring because we wouldn't really learn anything. We would just show up. And if you won everything that you did and everything was easy, you wouldn't really have any resistance to push back at you to fight harder, to learn more, to overcome, to be a better person, be a better leader. And maybe for some of us, we need to do a bit of self-reflection and look back, okay, this is where I am right now. Be completely transparent and honest with yourself. How are you feeling? Uh, what's going on? How are you feeling mentally, physically, emotionally? Write that down. Do a paragraph for each thing and then write down where you want to be. Get those, get that down clear on paper. Where you are now, where you want to be. Look at it and then have another column. Okay, what do I have to do? And then from that point on, you can list like three things for each paragraph of like what I have to do each day to achieve of this person of where I want to be in maybe six months, 12 months, three months, set yourself a bit of a time frame and just give yourself something to work towards. Like it is a good time now for some self-reflection to really look back and assess like what are the things that we did take for granted, what did we miss and, and what is important for us, um, not only for our physical health, but you know, mental health. A lot of us go to the gym only because it feels good. And that is why we show up every day. We do things that feel good. If you do something that doesn't feel good, you don't go back for round two. Um, maybe you went on a date, didn't feel right, you didn't go back. You went on one date, a week later, or someone else felt good, went on another date. Like, that's just how we operate as humans. We do things that feel good. And going to the gym for a lot of us feels good. Whether you walk on the treadmill for half an hour and get a bit of a sweat up and uh, feel like you've achieved and you felt good, great, well done. That's all you had to do. doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about that person that walked on the treadmill for 45 minutes. No one's sitting there going, oh, look at that person on the treadmill. That's just your head, your own thoughts saying that, probably because you've said it before because you've judged someone. So if we stop judging other people, um, we will be less likely um, to have that negative mindset that people are judging us. And if you want to uh, help yourself fight off COVID or any future viruses or the uh, the other ones that are still uh, floating around like the, the regular uh, flu, uh, being physically fit uh, gives you a stronger uh, immune system because if you've been properly paying attention to uh, who's actually at risk from serious long-term effects or death from coronavirus it's those who elderly vulnerable or with uh, uh comorbidities yeah for sure and like you could easily just look at your close circle of friends look around them look at okay who's always sick i've always got that friend that's always crook right there's always someone that's always got the flu look at what they do 
nine times out of ten, that person probably isn't a regular gym goer, probably doesn't keep themselves, um, you know, too fit. And you look at the people that have, you know, thrived through this, we look back through history, we look at other sorts of flus and pandemics, and it's like, um, you know, the strong survive. And we said that in business as well. And, you know, the weak don't make it. And it's a really, really harsh reality. But, you know, the strong do survive and push through. And if, if you've gotten through this far, like, man, you just keep pushing. Uh, I put up a question from one of my regulars, uh, Anita, who asked, do you have advice for an elderly lady with arthritic knees and nerve damaged feet who's putting on weight despite walking her grandkids back and forth to school two or three times a day? I know that this is just a, a question in the comments, uh, but uh, uh, do you have any basic recommendations? Yeah, like um, it's really, really hard. Like I used to be that trainer that thought that I could just like bang and fix everyone like that. But you know, the more I grew, the more I learned, the more I realized that everybody's super unique and they have to get a better understanding of your position and you know what it actually looks like and what you're actually limited to doing. But um, I would say like if you're doing two to three walks per week, I'd say that's great, keep it going. Maybe aim for like, five days a week next week, see how that feels, see if, you're, if your body responds well to that from with your foot and make that just one component of what you do, right? Like, like I said earlier on in this podcast was we look at daily steps, we look at your sleep quality, we look at nutrition and we also look at your workouts. So there's, there's four pillars there um, without knowing your nutrition history, um, without knowing your sleep quality and how well you sleep, all I know is that you're walking two to three times a week. And is that two, three days a week enough for you to do 8,000 steps per day for the week? So without trying to lose you too much, if we're aiming for 8,000 steps a day over the course of seven days for a full week, that's 56,000 steps in one week. So you don't have to do 8,000 steps per day. You just need to do 56,000 per week. If you're, if you're achieving that in the two to three days, great. If you're not, look at ways that you can increase that. And if you're not finding any change there, I would say there's probably two things. Nutrition, you may be eating slightly too many calories above your um, metabolic baseline with your energy expenditure attached to that. What that means is like a... Um, like a car, right? If you put too much fuel in the car, it's going to pour out the cap. But if we put just enough in to keep going, it's got something to burn. Um, <clears throat> so eat too much, put on weight. Eat too much, move less, put on more weight. So the last thing I'll be looking at is some form of intense workouts. I know, so in the elderly bracket, um, intensity is can be tricky. But there are some really good, I would honestly get into like some group stuff. You know, try and find like a group aerobics like in the swimming pool. Really good um, if they're open. <laughs> um, maybe some um, like Tai Chi is really good on the joints. And even just going to the gym using like the machines. So we're looking at, you know, preventing osteoporosis. So strength training is proven time and time again to reverse that, good for bone health, good for your joints. So maybe just look at just adding some resistance to your body in some way. You don't need to go hammer and tong. Like from what you're doing, you just need to build on it. Just do a little bit more than what you're doing if your body allows you to. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah, well, I hope Anita found that, uh, that useful. Well, I've appreciated you, Chris, uh, uh, coming on uh, tonight. I, I hope that, uh, well, I'm glad that you and your clientele are able to get back to it now and hope uh, that uh, there's a, a speedy recovery for your uh, industry and also uh, a speedy uh, recovery for those who are motivated enough to, to get their, their fitness back after many months uh, cooped up. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be on here um, and answer a few questions for the guys. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to shoot them across. Uh, I can uh, help you out in any way I can. Excellent. Take care. Thanks, mate. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. 
and keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.